But anyway, I'm on my own today. I'm going to be talking what I'm trying to do with this session. We get a whole heap of nonsense, don't we, guys? We eat what we eat. It's really healthy. We all look oh, terrific. Nice. We all it's feel gorgeous. terrific. And we get so much nonsense yeah, 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 from yeah. other people. You're I'll killing yourself. You're going to clog up your arteries and fall over and die any minute. Um, and I just want to take four of the most common bits of nonsense that we get and to arm this audience with some facts about food to help us fight back. So the four beliefs that I want to shatter in the next 25 minutes are the 3,500 calorie formula, the idea, the very idea that red meat is full of saturated fat and all these wonderful plant foods are full of nothing but unsaturated fat, the notion, and Trudy is going to cover this a lot more in the afternoon, so I'm literally just going to touch on it, but the idea that total fat, especially saturated fat, is going to kill you, and if the fat doesn't kill you, then the cholesterol will. Um, and then I just want to end, because I think we're all going to be giving upbeat messages during these talks. I want to end by saying, what should we be eating, or what should our approach to food be? And I'll suggest something at the end. So straight into the calorie formula, and um, what I'm going to be getting you to do is we've got to stop defending, because we're not the public health advisors. We're not here to defend, did we reverse type 2 diabetes or did we, did we not? They're the ones who've set the agenda. We've got to start lobbing some questions back. So here are the kind of questions that you've got to lob back. Here is the statement of the calorie formula from the British Dietetic Association. It has two parts. A pound contains 3,500 calories, so to lose a pound you need to create a deficit of 3,500 calories, either by eating less or doing more. This is the heart of all the calories in, the calories out nonsense. So the question we ask back any time we get people saying, oh, it's all about calories, is please can you source and prove the calorie formula? Because let's just start off with the one pound equals three and a half thousand calories. Now, I failed to get any public health advisor, and you'll see who I've approached in a second, to actually put this together. But this is me as a background in maths, just playing with a few numbers. One pound equals 454 grams. Decimal places aside, that is a fact. One gram of fat equals nine calories. Not correct. A pound of adipose, human fat tissue, approximately 87% lipid, also not a fact. And you put all of those together, and this is me being really as kind as I can, and you end up with a pound equals 3,555 calories. And you think, well, that's close enough. Except, unfortunately, this is still on the National Obesity Forum website, because they are, of course, our best friends at the moment. But they do have this statement, one fewer 50-calorie plain biscuit per day. Over the year, you're going to lose five pounds, one fewer biscuit, whatever. I mean, it just doesn't happen. You're out by a plain digestive biscuit already on the best that I can do with your numbers. No biscuits required. Your weight is going to go wild. So let's have a look at what we can actually do with those numbers. We'll keep the one pound equals 454 grams. A gram of fat, now this is really interesting because the original nine calories for a gram of fat was actually 9.3. It was the work of Rubner and Atwater back in 1901 and we haven't revisited it since. So I meant to say the um, references here are all on zoeharkham.com forward slash phc. So I haven't gone and listed Wishnowski 1958 and all that kind of nonsense. They're all on there for those of you who like the paper references. Um, so at the lower end of what a gram of fat could be, we have the work of Jeff Livesey from 2002 when a group were asked to relook at this. And he said, we think a gram of fat is about 8.7 calories. Now the 9.5 comes from the 1958 Wishnowski paper where he said, I think it's about 9.5. And the guys actually said it was 9.3. Now, when you start playing with the numbers, those decimal places really count. And they count on human fat tissue as well. Because the article where I got the idea that human fat tissue could be 87% lipid is the very same 1911 Bosenrad article that said it might be 72% lipid. That's a heck of a range. Now we play with those calculations and we put in the lower number or the higher number. Put in the lower number, we can make a pound equal 2,843 calories. Put in the higher number and we get almost the identical number that Wyshnowski was using back in 1958. But that is one heck of a range. And if you look at those numbers in the brackets at the end, if you think you can maintain weight currently with one pound equaling 3,500 calories, and in fact one pound equals 2,800, you will gain 84 pounds each year. 
If, on the other hand, it's bigger than we think it is, you're going to lose almost two stone each year. That is how barking this stuff is. And yet, go to journal articles, pick up any women's men, women health, men's health. Those are the two best magazines for the examples of this. They will have some diet features saying, three and a half thousand fewer calories, deficit, you'll lose a pound. Oh, no, you won't. So where does the calorie formula come from? Here's where I think it might come from. But again, you won't get this from public health advisors. They haven't got a clue. So there's a book that's now out of copyright, so you can get it freely available on the internet. References again at the bottom. Diet and Health, Lulu Hunt-Peters, lived out of America. I think it was Los Angeles. I kind of see her a bit as the Gillian McKeith of her day lover. But she wrote this um, book, and in the book she said, 500 calories is about two ounces of fat. Two ounces per day is about four pounds per month. She then does that little calculation. And she goes slightly wrong with the maths because if you actually cut back by 1,000 calories a day, you reduce your weight by 104 pounds in fat alone by the end of the year. Now, as I like to point out, I'm about 110 pounds. So if I cut back by 1,000 calories a day, which should be achievable, I eat quite a lot, I'm due to be six pounds in a year's time. <laughs> Only I should have lost lean tissue and water on top, so I probably should have died you know, somewhere a couple of months ago. That's how crazy this is. And we have people coming in saying, you know, I, I want to be losing at least two pounds a week. You know, 104 pounds a year isn't fast enough for me. Well, check out the Franz study from 2007 and see what actually happens when you follow calorie deficit people for four years. They're lucky if they're a couple of kilos down at the end of that period. So I think she came up with this, because she actually said in the book, um, the words are clever, I wrote them myself. And I don't think she's being cocky. I think she's saying, I'm original here. She might have invented this whole stuff, and nobody since knows what's happening. And so this is the group of people that I asked. Um, that little question that I just told you guys, can you source the formula? and um, prove it. British Dietetic Association, they're going to crop up a bit today, I suspect. National Health Service, National Obesity Forum, Department of Health, National Institute for Clinical Excellence, as it was when I asked them back in June 2009, National Institute of Care and Health Excellence, as they like to call themselves now, Dietitians in Obesity Management. It's an arm of the BDA looking specifically at obesity and the Association for the Study of Obesity. So the first three, um, no idea, try the Department of Health, try the Association for the Study of Obesity. So I did, and those four then came back as follows. The Department of Health, this is Department of Health, UK Department of Health. The department is unaware of the rationale behind the weight formula you refer to. I don't refer to it, it's not my formula. I think it's a heap of pants. It's your formula, <laughs> and you don't even know where it comes from. National Institute of Care and Health Excellence, our evidence body in the UK. While we are, I'll, I'll shorten this quote for you, while we are an evidence-based body, we have no evidence for one pound <laughs> equals three and a half thousand calories. Okay. Then we had dietitians in obesity management, and I'll bring them up together, the Association for the Study of Obesity, working independently, quite impressive, came up with the same study, which makes you think there probably is only that one study. And the dietitian said, there's good evidence that a 600 calorie deficit produces a weight difference of about five kilograms at one year. And the Association for the Study of Obesity put a bit of meat on the bones. We then found out this study has 12 people on that 600 calorie a day deficit. So apply the formula, they should have lost 62.57 pounds of fat. Each and every person, doesn't matter what age, what gender, what starting weight was, a formula is a formula. We all start off with the same formula. And they were on average 11 pounds lighter. And the range was 0.8 to 17.2. Now, I hope Andy doesn't mind me saying, my husband, you know, 0.8, you just went to the toilet. You know, it's not, it's not a spectacular weight loss at the end of a one-year clinical trial. And we have this small issue of fat versus water. That was 62.57 pounds of fat. Probably you should have been up at about 80 pounds in terms of lean tissue and water. And here's the big killer, guys. I've asked all these organizations. We have one study with 12 people. We have 1.5 billion overweight people in the world. And we can't even get within a multiple of five on 12 people. And you want to have a debate about calories in and calories out. Right, second one. Animal fat is saturated, plant fat is unsaturated. I'm going to give you one question now, and then there's a slightly different one at the end. Um, but to keep the pace up, shout out very quickly. If you've seen this 
in South Africa. I did use this slide because I love it. Here's a sirloin steak, here's some eggs, here's some oily fish, here's some lard, almonds, olive oil, and low-fat milk. Do any of these, all of these, how many of these, shout out any that you think have got more saturated than unsaturated fat? Lard. Lard? No, we've got shakes of no for lard from the front, because I know they know. Nuts. Nuts. Red meat. I mean, come on, red meat gets a bash in. Okay, it's this one. This is the only one that's got more saturated fat than unsaturated fat. Because I'm just going to stick on the numbers now. These are all per 100 grams of food, so you can immediately just see them as percentages. So what you've got here is the total fat, the first number, saturated fat as the second number. So you can see that only in the skim milk do you actually have more saturated fat than unsaturated fat. Because all the other foods have more unsaturated than saturated fat. Not that one is better or worse for you than the other, but here's where we have a bit of fun. Because our dear public health advisors say, have oily fish. You remember, you're supposed to be avoiding total fat and saturated fat. Have oily fish, but do not have red meat. Well, it's got twice the total fat of red meat and one and a half times the saturated fat. What about this olive oil? 14 times the total fat, seven times the saturated fat of red meat. And yet we're not supposed to have one, we're supposed to have the other. Oh yes, but we wouldn't have 100 grams of olive oil, I hear you saying. No, but one tablespoon of olive oil has got more saturated fat than a 100 gram pork chop. So if you know a little bit about food, and that's what this presentation is about, it's nonsense. And I'd like to start a renaming campaign. I'd like to rename saturated, because it's got a really bad name, a stable. Because the reason it's called saturated, any of you remember your chemistry? Fats are just chain of, uh, chains of carbons with hydrogens attached to them. The saturated just has all the hydrogen slots filled. So it's the safest to cook with, it's the most stable. So we're going to now call it stable fat. Then when you've got one um, pair of hydrogen bonds missing, it's called monounstable. When you've got many missing, it's called polyunstable. So those are the different fats. So you now know from that last slide, there are only two things about fat that people need to know that seemingly some people don't know. They talk as if you can avoid saturated fat in your diet and not die. And it is actually completely impossible because every food that contains fat contains all three fats. There are no exceptions whatsoever. And the second fact about fat, which is not well known, is only dairy products as a food group have more saturated than unsaturated fat. Now, you will, of course, be aware coconut oil has more saturated, but it's not a whole food group. As a food group, it's dairy. I'll throw in a bonus factoid about nutrition because it's going to be fun on the next slide. All foods contain protein except your pure fats, your oils and lard, and sucrose, which isn't really a food. So we're going to have a quick look at this on this little table here. What we're doing is just taking a number of foods. On the link, you've got all the sources so you can see these for yourself. Sucrose is not really a food, but it's 100% carb, not even water, no protein, no fat. And then this column is going to go up in order of fat content. I love this already. I mean, look, pork and whole wheat pita bread, because, of course, whole wheat pita bread tends to be commercially produced, full of vegetable oils, and it's actually got more fat than your pork chop. And you can see some of the other statistics from the previous slide. Now, the two things to point out about this are the carb, protein, and fat thing. You've got pure fats, you've got pure, car pure carbs, everything else has protein. Then when you take the fat column, it doesn't quite add up totally to rounding errors, but then I've pulled out in green the highest fat from all of those. So you've got monounsaturated polo, mono, 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 mono. That's the only one butter dairy product that has more saturated than unsaturated fat. Not that it's bad but just to set the record straight. So, belief three. Total and especially saturated fat will kill you, and here's the only question you need to remember. Show me one RCT, randomized controlled trial, with healthy men and women, ideally greater than a year, I don't think you'll find one in under a year, um, with showing that total and or saturated fat increases mortality. You pick the mortality, whatever you want. CVD, CHD, cancer, all cause, whatever. Give you free reign because, of course, I know the answer. You are not going to be able to find it. Now, just to give you some headlines on why I know we don't have that evidence, we had a paper that came out in February last year, created a bit of an upset with Public Health England, that basically said if you went back to when the dietary guidelines were introduced, there were only six trials available, and they did not support either of those two 
fat recommendations, 30% total fat, 10% saturated fat. Second massive finding was that those six studies involved not even 2,500 sick men. So women globally have been doing all this nonsense and we didn't even prove it in those unhealthy men. Now the PHE defense, bless them, was, oh yes, but we've got loads of evidence now. Um, and then, oh yes, but there was loads of epidemiological evidence at the time. Um, well, actually there wasn't, and there are a couple of papers in submission and one in production that they're not gonna like any more than the first one because the RCT evidence today still comes to the same conclusion. There is no evidence. Epidemiological evidence at the time, not there. Epidemiological evidence today, not there. There are still no dietary fat intervention trials that study healthy men and women. For those of you really familiar with the subject, there's the Minnesota um, mental institution patient, bit of a clue there. Okay, they weren't suffering from heart disease, but they were patients in a mental institution, and we know a lot about mental illness and heart disease and the sympathetic nervous system, so we haven't had that generalizable study, as it's called, that we can apply to whole populations. And for the final chapter of my PhD, looking at this, I looked at all the meta-analyses and all of their conclusions. 39 findings, 35 were non-significant. That is never reported. The only thing that's reported is the significant findings. I think it's even more important what wasn't found. And in 35 studies, sorry, 35 lines across seven studies, nothing was found. One found against trans fats, no surprise. One found in favor of polyunsaturated fats. I'm part of a paper that attacked that for including the wrong papers. And two Cochrane ones said there's a little bit of something almost touching the line of no significance with events, but not mortality. So you're really safe asking that question. Can you show me that one RCT on healthy people that's going to prove either of those dietary fat guidelines? Because it isn't there. Now the final one, if fat doesn't kill you, then cholesterol will. So ask them this, what's the association, let's start with the association, between cholesterol and deaths, CVD, all cause, what do you want, for men and women, not just for seven countries or for however many countries you want to pick, but for all 192 countries for which there is data available at the World Health Organization. I did this a few years ago on a Saturday afternoon, it doesn't actually take very long, on the link I've explained how you could do it. Um, this is men and cardiovascular disease deaths, and you can see that it's just a very slight downwards trend line, but basically saying the higher your cholesterol, the lower the death rate, the lower your cholesterol, the higher the death rate. It's only very slight, and for the statisticians, they're not terribly exciting, but it's not doing that, which is what we're told it should do. This is now women and cardiovascular disease deaths. It's getting quite a bit steeper. I've stuck the UK on just for interest. Um, we're pretty low on the death rate and pretty, well, I think we're pretty low on cholesterol actually, but there we go. Um, then we go to all deaths and it's getting steeper again. This is men and all cause mortality. Essentially, you do not want low cholesterol if you want to stay alive for a long period of time on the evidence of 192 countries in the world. And women and all deaths, whoa, we really, really, really do not want low cholesterol women. This is not a good position to be in. Now, Malcolm Kendrick has shown people those slides, and doctors have said, oh my goodness, it's even worse than we feared. And, and he said, did you look at which way around they were? And they still can't change the mindset. But we know cholesterol causes heart disease. Um, sometimes, you know, Malcolm is now working on when the evidence is overwhelming, what do you do to get people to accept it? Because for him, there's no point working on the evidence anymore. It's that second question we need to work on. So what, would you, what should we eat? Um, number one, real food. Such a shame we have to call it real food. I want to reclaim food as what grows around us and what we're supposed to eat. So number one, eat real food. I used to say three times a day because of the work of people like Rongon and Jason Fung. I now say three times a day maximum. We have got to stop this grazing. I said on a radio show once, you know, unless you are a cow or want to be the size of one, stop <laughs> grazing. You can't do it. Thank you. And number three, manage your carbohydrate intake. And I think that will get most people a long way there. 
When I think you need to do that the other way around is there are certain conditions, we talked about one, type 2 diabetes, epilepsy would be another. There will be occasions when you need to manage carbohydrate intake, so you basically come in from the other end. But you might then start doing some things a little bit unreal in terms of food, um, putting butter on eggs and all of that kind of thing. But that should get most people most of the way there. The only debate for me then in nutrition is what should that real food be? Should it be plants or should it be animals? Declaration of interest here, I was a vegetarian for 20 years, um, so I did make mistakes. We're not all perfect. Um, Michael Pollan very famously says, eat food, mostly plants, not too much. I think we need to eat food, mostly animals, quite a lot. <laughs> and I'll show you why in the next slide. Um, so he's much more on the whole grains, beans, pulses, fruit. We agree on real food. We'll be good friends when it comes to real food. We won't be quite so good friends on what that real food should be. Pasture-fed meat and eggs and dairy from those animals, fish, nuts, fruits in season. We'd agree on vegetables and salads, and we'd agree on real food. So that's good. Why would I say animals and not plants? Because your second question should be, Look at the micronutrients, not just the macronutrients. And I've just picked out half a dozen foods. I've picked out what I have so far found to be the healthiest food on the planet. If anyone finds a better one, I'm happy to swap out liver, but it's going to be offal of some kind. I'll give you a clue. Oily fish, sunflower seeds, um, broccoli, vegetables, your five-a-day kind of stuff, and then whole wheat flour, which is actually the single well, flour. I was really generous going for whole wheat because we actually eat flour white. Um, but white flour is the single biggest substance consumed by both Brits and Americans. So I thought it's important to put that one up there. And then what I've done for all the vitamins on this slide, and I've just pulled out in red the winner in that row. Um, so the winner for sunflower seeds on calorie is, uh, sorry, on calories is sunflower seeds. And then the winner on protein quality and so many of the vitamins is, of course, liver. Sardines great for vitamin D, sunflower seeds for E, and so on. But you notice that fruit five a day, ho-ho, and whole wheat flour, even whole wheat, are not cleaning up on anything. That's why I think you should be choosing animals over plants. I love this one. Did you know that liver has four times the vitamin C of an apple? Not many people know that. Um, and yet we're supposed to have our apple when the liver has so much other good stuff. So we come to minerals, and our plants come from the ground. So you would expect plants to start doing quite well here. Um, they still don't do terribly well. Sunflower seeds really come into their own. Um, and they do pretty well on manganese, which I must admit irritated me a little. So I then changed the table, and I said, oh, if I put in cocoa, because I really like dark chocolate, cocoa wipes the floor with everything else. So enjoy your dark chocolate. Cocoa powder. Cocoa powder on your cappuccino. The evidence is there, girls. This is not a fiction, this chocolate thing we have going on. We need to be eating it. So I'm going to wrap up now. We've covered the 3,500 calorie formula. All food that contains fats contain all three fats. Dairy is the only group that has more saturated than unsaturated, not that we care. There was no evidence, RCT or epidemiological, against total or saturated fat at the time, and there is none now. And cholesterol is actually inversely associated with deaths. So your questions. Can you source and prove the calorie formula? I suggest your question on saturated fat, unless you carry around that little chart, should be, what's your beef with dairy products? because that's all you're having a row about. If you really want to talk saturated fat, the government list of saturated fat is hysterical. Pies, ice cream, confectionery, biscuits, pastries, junk food. You know, there is room for heated agreement with the other side to say, look, just stop calling that nonsense saturated fat. Call it what it is. Can we agree on real food? Then can we sit down and look at the evidence for the micronutrients? And you never know, we might actually end up not having slanging matches on Twitter. Can you produce me that one RCT? No, you can't. And what's the association? Now, I love little Malcolm Kendrick's saying, you know, association does not prove causation, but lack of association disproves causation. If you cannot even show me an association between cholesterol and heart deaths or cholesterol and all deaths, you're really going to struggle to take me to the place that cholesterol is causing heart disease because the evidence that I'm looking at is saying the opposite. This is the final slide, and I'm bang on 25 minutes. I got this from Barry Groves, bless his soul. 
I saw Barry speak at a conference. It was actually Barry who ended my 20 years of vegetarianism. And Barry said, you know, what is it? We don't see animals in the jungle queuing up to see the jungle doctor. Um, you know, civilized, so-called civilized man is the only chronically sick animal on the planet. So I'm sort of driving back to Wales thinking, mm, what's my first meat going to be? Um, and it suddenly occurred to me, is this because man is the only species clever enough to make his own food, but stupid enough to eat it? <laughs> Thank you for listening.